Hello everyone, welcome to our video on causality in epidemiology where we're going to define what is a cause and look at different historical views of causation to include number one, Koch's postulates number two, Bradford Hill's criteria and number three, Rothman's causal models. And so first up, let's define what is a cause. And so I'll pull up a picture here. In this, we see that in epidemiology, the main objective is to explain an association that may exist between an exposure variable and an outcome variable. In order for this association to be an actual cause between variables, we have to rule out one of three things. One being bias, whether it be selection bias or measurement bias. Remember, these are our two major types of bias. If none exists and the association is not due to some random chance, that's our number two, and the association is not confounded by a third variable independent of exposure or outcome variables, that's our number three, then there is causation. And with that said, we do have a few historical views of causation that we'll go through, with the earliest one being proposed by Robert Koch, in which he proposed specific criteria that should be met before concluding that a disease was caused by a particular bacterium. Specifically, he had four postulates, which came to be known as Koch's postulates. We'll go through them briefly here. The only limitation with these is that they are confined to infectious diseases. And so keeping this in mind, Koch's first postulate stipulated that bacteria must be present in every case of the infectious disease that is being investigated. Whereas his second postulate, this stipulated that bacteria must be isolated from the host with the disease and then grown in pure culture. Whereas his third postulate, this stipulated that the specific disease at hand must be able to be reproduced when a pure culture of the bacteria is then inoculated into a healthy susceptible host. And so of course there is an ethical component to consider here. Again, Robert Koch did propose these postulates in the 1800s prior to any research guidelines or regulations. Definitely some limitations to consider here. And his last postulate, number four, this stipulated that the bacteria must be recoverable from the experimentally infected host. And so with that said, we can see that these postulates established a standard criteria for drawing conclusions about the cause of infectious disease, but the criteria obviously don't apply here to non-infectious diseases. And so we'll take a look at additional views of causation next. Here we have Bradford Hill's criteria for causality that proposed certain aspects of evidence that should be considered when trying to draw conclusions about causality in epidemiology. These were not necessarily intended to be rigid criteria, rather they are meant to be guidelines. And so starting with our number one, strength of the association, this states that the stronger the association that exists between variables, the less likely that this association is due to something like bias. And one way of identifying such strengths of associations is through our measures of association, which if you remember, these are our risk ratio versus our odds ratio used in our cohort studies versus our case control studies. Number two, we have our dose response effect. This states that if the disease frequency increases with the dose or level of exposure, this then supports a causal interpretation. Number three, we have temporality. This refers to a time component and is perhaps the most important criteria. 
which states that the hypothesized cause must precede the occurrence of the disease in order to establish causality. On to number four, we have consistency. And this states that if all studies being researched dealing with a given relationship produce similar results, then a causal interpretation is likely. Then we have number five, our biological plausibility of the hypothesis. This is also known as our biological gradient and states that if the hypothesized effect makes sense in the context of current biological knowledge, then this supports a causal interpretation. On to our number six. This is our coherence of the evidence criteria. And this states that if the findings do not seriously conflict, meaning there is no conflict with our understanding of the natural history of the disease or other accepted facts about the specific disease occurrence being studied, then this supports a causal interpretation. Number seven, we have specificity of the association. This one is important and refers to the study factor being found to be associated with only one disease or the disease is found to be associated with only one factor making it specific to the case, then a causal interpretation is supported. Number eight, we have experimentation. This makes use of experiments or experimental evidence such as clinical trials in humans, animal models, or in vitro lab experiments, which may support causal theories when available if ethical. Lastly, number nine, we have analogy. And this is when similar, when similar relationships have been shown with other exposure disease relationships and a causal relationship is then supported. Again, these criteria provide a framework to aid thinking and consideration of causality, but are not a checklist of required elements. Although helpful for conceptualizing causal relationships, these criteria have been widely criticized by modern epidemiologists since the notion of causality is a complex one. Given practical and ethical considerations, human studies, which are the basis of epidemiology, generally cannot prove causality. With that being said, we'll look at our last model, Rothman's model of causality. This is a more recent cause model by Rothman, an epidemiologist in 1976, who proposed a conceptual model of causation. This came to be known as the sufficient component cause model in an attempt to provide a practical view of causation, which also has a sound theoretical basis that we'll go through and define briefly here. Rothman's causal model is oftentimes based on sufficient versus necessary component causes, which are usually depicted in the form of pies, where different parts of the pie make up a component cause, with one being necessary, or another being sufficient, or a third being both, or a fourth being neither. And so with that said, there are four types of causal relationships here that we'll go through and define, with number one being both necessary and sufficient. Meaning without the factor, the disease never develops. And with the factor, the disease always develops. This situation rarely occurs, and I'll pull up a visual so that we can better understand what goes on here. Here, without the factor, the disease never develops, whereas with the factor present, the disease always develops. 
Again, this is very rare occurrence. One such example used to be the HIV virus, which then causes AIDS. And to some extent, this holds true because we know the end stage of HIV is the development of AIDS. It is necessary to have HIV in order to get AIDS. Is it sufficient though, meaning in the presence of HIV? Will AIDS always develop? This isn't necessarily true anymore nowadays with advances in antiviral medications. Number two, we have necessary but not sufficient. In this type of causal relationship, the factor in and of itself is not enough to cause the disease. Rather, multiple ones are required. This is usually seen in some kind of temporal sequence where there's a time factor, such as in cancer. So I'll pull up a visual here so that we can walk through it. So again, here we have multiple factors that are all necessary to contribute to the disease, but one alone is not sufficient enough to cause the disease. In the case of cancer, perhaps this is some kind of genetic predisposition in addition to an environmental trigger that all happens in sequence that then contribute to the disease. Number three is sufficient but not necessary, where the factor alone can cause the disease, but so can other factors in its absence. For example here, benzene exposure or radiation exposure can cause leukemia without the presence of the other factor, making it sufficient but not necessary. And I'll pull up an in this image here, this is as opposed to our top figure where factors A must occur with factors B and C. This is factor A or B or C that may contribute to the same disease. Number four is our last type of causal relationship under Rothman's model. This states neither sufficiency nor necessary factors. This is where the factor cannot cause disease on its own, nor is it the only factor that can cause that disease. An example here tends to be your more complex chronic diseases, perhaps something like diabetes, in which there are more than one factor involved, maybe hypertension maybe hyperlipidemia, maybe even obesity. And so here's an image of the probable model for such chronic disease relationships. And with that said, we can go on to our black screen of spaced repetition to quiz ourselves over concepts in this video. Number one. The following statement is an example of which of Hill's criteria of causality. Cases of stomach cancer tend to be diagnosed 20 years after initial asbestos exposure. And I've underlined the key hint here for that question. And the answer is temporality that time factor mentioned that correlates with the temporality postulate in Bradford Hill's criteria of causality. So number two, the following statement is an example of which of Hill's criteria? The odds ratio for association between liver cancer and hepatitis is eight. And the answer here is strength of association as measured by our odds ratio, which is a measure of association. Number three, the following statement is an example of which of Hill's criteria? There's a progressively higher relative risk with increasing degree of exposure. 
This is an example of our dose response criteria. Number four, lastly, this statement is an example of which of Hill's criteria. Seven previously published epidemiologic studies concluded similar results. And the answer here is consistency. And with that said, our next slide is an overview of everything that was discussed in this video. Please subscribe below, like, and share.